Money lost, money burned, money quite literally gone up in smoke. When it comes to financial as well as environmental choices, why do some still think that fossil fuels have a future? You're watching Roundtable. Good to have your company. I'm David Foster. BlackRock, described sometimes as the world's biggest investor, has lost an estimated, wait for it, $90 billion in the last decade, apparently by ignoring the financial risk of investing in fossil fuel companies. Time, perhaps, to back clean energy, to save the planet, and perhaps save you a fortune. <laughs> Fossil fuels have and continue to play a dominant role in global energy systems. Even though 18 countries around the world have declared a climate emergency, about 80% of our energy needs still come from oil, coal and gas. And investors continue to spend tens of billions of dollars in oil, gas and mining companies. The world's largest institutional investor, BlackRock, has plenty of cash in oil giants like ExxonMobil, Chevron, Shell and BP, but a new report found that those companies made up the bulk of BlackRock's losses over the past decade. Even the everyday person looking to save for the future may be exposed, as pension and saving schemes are likely to have some money in fossil fuel companies. So are fossil fuel investments still in your future? And we can say hello in Australia, Melbourne, in fact, to Tim Buckley from the Institute of Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, who's just written a very important report about all of this. At the round table, Kingsmill Bond, new energy strategist and carbon tracker. We'll find out what that is. And Justin Urquhart, Stuart, co-founder of Seven Investment Management. Great to have you all along. It is important, I know. It's a bit of a dry subject, but we'll find out why it really does matter in just a moment. Uh, Tim, I know you said hello as I introduced you, so hello again. I described it as a very important report that you've just written. Now, some people may say, look, it doesn't affect me. In what way does it have wider implications? I think we have seen over the last decade the tip of the iceberg in terms of the impact of stranded assets in the fossil fuel sector. And this report on BlackRock is highlighting that the biggest investor in the world has lost upwards of 90 billion US dollars in the last decade on just 20 individual stock exposures. Now, that so just really to stop you very quickly, for those that don't understand it, stranded assets mean your money's stuck there and you can do nothing about it and it might just disappear. It means you're not getting an economic return over the useful life of the assets. So carry on. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg and I'd probably reference the recent paper by the Bank of England which estimates that assets at risk by 2050 are in the order of $20 trillion. So losing $90 billion is a large amount of money. Losing $20 trillion for the global financial system is going to be catastrophic. And we're talking so about a trillion because it's difficult to quantify this or even think about numbers that big as being a 1,000 or a 100 billion. Justin, you start on that one. What do you reckon? <laughs> it's a 1,000. A 1,000 yeah. billion... And then that's 20 trillion of those, it's the Bank huge. of England says. Yeah. Look, I've got, I've got part of the report here. It's 54 pages. It makes very difficult reading unless you follow these things closely. Uh, what do you reckon the most important thing out of this was? Well, like, Don't touch fossil fuel stocks with a barge pole? No, but watch, count up the number of noughts you're actually dealing with. Because you say people can't get right. in there, like, what's a trillion, a billion, a million? So it sounds huge, but you've got to put it into context as the rest of the market. So the gift of foresight, you would have said, well, I can see actually what's happening here, and they wouldn't have lost that amount of money. Money. But actually what you'll find with BlackRock or any decent investment firm, they would have been spreading their assets around different asset classes, some of which will have failed. Remember, this year's fashion fad is next year's tank top, and I'm a proud owner of a few of those. <laughs> so you're saying that, OK, they've lost £90 billion on, on this sector, but they may have made money elsewhere, so oh. they're not a financial basket case. And yet we hear about the carbon bubble, a la South Sea bubble you know, financial enterprises that have gone boom and then gone bang, uh, the dot-com bubble. Are we seeing a carbon bubble here? There is a spectacular carbon bubble, which is being deflated by the oldest story of all in emerging markets, which is technology disruption. 
and you simply have cheaper, faster, better technologies which are coming and disrupting the incumbents. And people who understand that will make money. Those who fail to understand it will lose it. Yeah, and it's going to go bang spectacularly. I think Nature magazine describes it as one of the biggest crashes we could see in, 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 in terms of finances and people sort of well, it's a different risks. Level. The large the industry will get caught up because it won't be able to change fast enough and then the newcomers will come along and take their clothes away. But always, I think, one of the uh, interesting elements, when you see the private investor starting to get involved in some of these areas, and that's when the alarm bell goes. You, and you see, suddenly... this, is, this is what I wonder, is, is, is why does it matter? I mean, we're talking about BlackRock, big investor, hedge funds, uh, very wealthy people. Why, why does it matter to, you know, with all due respect to our audience out there, very few of us are billionaires. Um, no, so, but so many, why does it matter? But everybody should be, and in some areas, you know, it's almost compulsory in certain countries, will be saving and investing as part of that. And in that investments, there will be a very small proportion which will be involved in these things. So whether it's the FTSE 100 or any of the other things people can track around the world, in people's savings, pensions, long-term investing, there'll be elements of this. And if you happen to have a fund manager who's decided to go for the fashion stocks and follow those, yeah. then your pension won't be getting very far. Tim, Tim, let's come back to you. Um, what about this carbon bubble? What do you make of it? I think it's very real. And I think financial markets will realise this a lot faster than the operating environment, as Justin just said. I mean, you build a coal-fired power plant, it'll be around for 20, 30, 40 years the owners of the coal plant probably will not make any return on it. So the financial market will price in this technology disruption that Kingsmill just mentioned, and they'll price it in relatively rapidly. So as I mentioned, the BlackRock report is really just to highlight, it's the tip of the iceberg. We're yet to see the full impact and I think it will be a pretty disorderly disruption, a technology-driven disruption. Justin, I know you wanted to say I... something. At this... Sorry, sorry, Tim, but Justin was jumping up and down. <laughs> well, I think because I love the comparison with an iceberg because, of course, it carries on like this. We won't have any icebergs anyway, tip or otherwise. But the point is, it's actually getting this now into the mainstream so people understand, A, is this something you could trade in, should you have an exposure to it, and the mm -hmm. industry, certainly the advice industry, has got mm -hmm. to try and make sure it's in a language that people understand. Otherwise, all you're doing is coming out with these wonderful, great terms. Everyone said, that's clever, but I haven't got a clue what he actually is on about. I wonder if it is a busted flush as such, because I, I was taking a look through some of these things, and uh, BP uh, wrote a report on, on renewables, and it says, yes, clean energy will increase, electric cars, the number of those will increase, there will be more and more people in the world, mm -hmm. therefore, perhaps, you know, clean energy will be taking a bigger share of the market, but fossil fuels will not disappear. In fact, I think the number it says here, um, projected to increase by almost 20% between 2016 and 2040. Because there will be more people, fossil fuels will still be needed. So the first question you have to ask yourself is, <clears throat> what does BP do? They You don't have to ask me. I think, they, uh, I think they, we know. They take oil and gas out of the ground and flog it to us. So what do you expect them to say? So no, but I mean, <clears throat> I, 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 I don't think this is in dispute that the, the proportion of fossil fuels used will go down because we've got more and more clean energy sources, but we will still need to have fossil fuels by the year 2040. Actually, it, it is very dramatically in dispute. Really, there are two narratives out there. There's the narrative of the incumbent, which is business as usual, and then there's the <clears throat> reality, which is that you're getting disruptive, rapid change. And, and it's very interesting that the new energy technologies of solar, of wind, of electric vehicles continuously grow much more rapidly than the incumbents are expecting. So year after year, they are changing their forecasts, recognising they got it wrong last year. And, and, and actually, um, as, as Tim is saying, financial markets are much more attuned to reality Mm. Than, uh, than corporations which try and cling on to what they do. So this is the guttering of the fossil fuel candle, is it? The last desperate hope of a dying industry. So take the UK. A um, hundred years ago, we used to get around on horses, we used to have gas lighting. Um, it's the moment of the peak of, of horses or the moment of the peak of gas lighting comes when you're challenging, your challenger is still quite small but taking all of the growth. But from there on down, it's downhill. Look what Aramco are doing. Uh, Saudi Arabia's oil company. Yeah. One of the reasons they come to the market now 
is that, well, I better sell these, sell these assets now, because in 100 years' time, they may not be worth anything because the technology would have bypassed it. Now, whether you believe that narrative or not, we're not, we're not most of us are not going to be here for 100 years, but it will have an impact. So therefore, they get some value for what is, uh, they've already got on the ground, sell it in advance, effectively. So it's like a fire sale. Well, if, it's, if it, it's not being sold cheaply, but what they're trying to do is actually make sure they get value now, because I can't guarantee I'll have that in 100 years' time. OK. Uh, uh, Tim, I, th I think you pointed out the similarity, perhaps, here between uh, what General Electric thought it could do and what, in fact, happened to it disastrously financially. I, I think that's a really helpful example, because we all know General Electric. I mean, 20 years ago, it was the biggest company in the world. Today, it is a virtual minnow. In the last three years alone, it's gone down, its shares have gone down 70%. And that is in a, a raging bull market for the US stock market. So investors not only lost two thirds of their investment in GE, but they failed to increase their existing portfolio by 50% if they just invested in the overall market instead. So it's interesting, BlackRock was the number one shareholder in GE. And it was literally in 2016, GE was forecasting the gas turbine market would be 50 or 60 gigawatts a year. Three years later, they're saying it'll be lucky to be 25 to 30 gigawatts. The market in front of their eyes has harmed. Mm. Kingsmill, I, I wanted to ask you about clean energy sources yes. and, and the best way it's going for what's really powering ahead, if I may, in just a <clears> moment. But, Justin, you wanted to come in. No, it's just merely on the matter of you can tell how much it's hit the mainstream when... Do you remember last year, the USA had... A, there was a solar eclipse going across America. Mm. The impact that had on the amount of power production being lost because they hadn't got <laughs> solar power... <clears throat> the previous decade, that happened, no impact at all. This decade, suddenly you saw 20% actually a, a drop because, actually, now they were missing this key element of, the, of uh, energy production. That wouldn't have happened before. And solar power in space, that's a programme we are going to do uh, fairly fairly soon, putting panels up there. That's the other half of this, of this isn't it? I mean, it's but, quite logical. So let me come to you, Kingsmill. I mean, you know, uh, w where you work, you are studying all of the new ideas and seeing which one might be the new, uh, the li new light bulb, if, if, if you like, as opposed to the guttering gas Candle, lamp. yes. Um, where, where is it going? Who, who's powering ahead here? So quite literally. This, this is an energy transition that's being driven by... Uh, very cheap solar and wind in the first instance. So in, in two-thirds of the world today, in 2019, it's now the cheapest energy source uh, is from solar... Sorry, the cheapest energy source of electricity is from solar and wind. And that's completely different to five years ago. And, and a lot of people still have this old thinking in mind that these are expensive energy sources. They're not anymore. Um, and, and then that's being complemented by the very rapid fall in the price of batteries, uh, which is driving... Uh, we're, we're talking about five big, years behind. big batteries here, aren't we? We're talking about lithium-ion batteries yeah. for cars. So the, the, the electricity sector's been transformed first, the transport sector's been transformed second, uh, then other sectors will follow in, in due course. But, but all of this is quite sufficient to drive a, a peaking of demand for fossil fuels. Are we going to see the big energy companies, BP, Shell, Aramco, etc., etc., um, investing well enough in these for them still to be able to, to have a raison d'etre? Well, they like to think so, but the, the, the great lesson of any disruptive energy transition is that incumbents usually fail. And you see that in sector after sector, telecoms, uh, computing, transportation. Um, the incumbents have a very large balance sheet. They find it very difficult to compete with all these new competitors with much lower cost structures, um, and, and they're held back by the stranded assets that they hold. So yeah. I, I wish good luck to these companies. I hope they do succeed. I hope they transition, but it'll be tough. You remember when BP the other year got laughed out when they were changing their brand and say it's no longer British Petroleum, it's this is beyond petroleum. And everyone laughed at it. But, of course, actually, that is their future. And the TV adverts at the moment are for BP oh, plug-ins for electric cars. Absolutely. So they're desperately trying to change not only the business, but the actual the image of actually what they've got at the moment. And so there will be some spectacular failures. So people say, well, I'm an oil person, that's all I've done in my life, I'll carry yeah. on doing it. And not helped, of course, by a certain yeah. president going on about still digging coal. This is for each one of you. And, Tim, I, I, you were sh nodding your head as though you wanted to say something anyway, so please go ahead and do so. But this is for each one of you here. Um, if the big giants fail, 
and we know that they're important geopolitically, then the power structure of the world may well shift to different places. Therefore, it's important to understand which countries uh, are behind the new energy sources and therefore which ones are perhaps most likely to succeed mm -hmm. and be the power brokers of the mm -hmm. future. Think about that while Tim says whatever he wants to say and uh, answers that question. Well, firstly, just uh, you mentioned BP and, in, and the incumbents and Kingsmill highlighted that. Exxon year to date is down 6%. The US stock market is up 32%. So this is happening before our eyes. Financial markets aren't going to take decades. OK, come back to you in a moment while you think about who's going to be the next world power, depending on who holds um, the energy sources. But I'll, I'll, I'll ask you I, that I one have a, I, Well, in fact, I, I, I co-authored a piece on this very issue um, about 12 months ago on the geopolitics of the energy transition. Yeah. And, look, w one of the very obvious conclusions is that the petrostates, um, and Venezuela is just the first, will struggle in this environment. A lot of power has, has accrued over the years to countries with a lot of fossil fuels. That power will drift, will dribble away. So that's one obvious conclusion. The second is that um, China is very much the leader of this transition, and it's very much an aspect of, of China's leapfrogging of the United States, the fact that they're leapfrogging America in terms of this new energy technology. Um, and then I think the third point, and since um, this is for, for Turkish TV, this is a very apposite observation, countries like Turkey which currently import almost all their oil and most of their gas and, and, and are spending a, a, a quarter of their imports on, on uh, fossil fuels will be in a much stronger position because Turkey can exploit its fantastic domestic sources of solar and wind. And, and therefore, countries like Turkey or like India, which are importing a lot of fossil fuels, will see a major shift in their geopolitical strength. So we're talking China, India, Turkey, countries with um, abundant sources of, uh, of a renewable of, of energy, re reasonable yes. sunshine, yes. among other things, and, and winds. OK, so what about um, the western side of the, the globe? Um, so Th does Venezuela have a means to bounce back? Does the United States, by adopting um, fracking and not needing to import oil, etc., et is, is it in any position to remain a superpower because of its energy yeah, of means? Course. Uh, actually, interestingly enough, um, in spite of the takeover of the heights of power by fossil fuel interests in the United States. In spite of that, the United States is not, in fact, a major energy exporter. Um, so they export a little bit of gas, some coal, actually at the moment not much oil. So it would not be catastrophic for the United States. And in fact, as you know, there are very strong forces within the United States which are seeking to have an energy leapfrog themselves. Um, and, and, and I think what we're now witnessing is a kind of energy space race between the United States and China. Uh, and, and let's see who wins. The power of the future, your turn, Justin. We'll be coming from the technology companies, and they don't have to be necessarily in any particular country. It's where the brains and initiative are to be able to develop it. So where would I look? Well, how about some of the Cambridge Science Parks and see some of the developments out there? Because what they're doing is here is a problem. What technology can we apply to improve it? So whether it's wind or solar, whatever it happens to be, the ability to do that on a mass scale and on a convertible scale right down to the retail market. And we're not there yet because you're seeing people, yes, they've got solar panels, they're still not that efficient yet. The thermal one, not really for the house, housing market. I've been talking about ge geothermal. You're geothermal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even the rather strange air, uh, extracting uh, heat out of just the air, even in cooler countries. All these elements are developing very quickly indeed, provide low-cost production, uh, to, a, to an area which I otherwise wouldn't have considered. You, you know, you talked about the Cambridge Science Park. Oh. This is Cambridge University in the area around there. Uh, they're developing one in and around Oxford as well. The oh. two universities are, are talking about teaming up and there's suggestion that there could be a new, not Silicon Valley in between the two because they're opening up the railway line uh, once again, but it could actually become a major area to help Britain... Um, expand post Brexit. Well, this is one of the so big, much has changed. This is one of the great success actually Britain's had over the past twenty years. We've set up more smaller companies in this country than we've had in France and Germany put together. And yet we're a nation not of entrepreneurs. Remember, most of our nation actually was based on actually what we achieved in the empire. And most people work for the, either the state or the services or a large corporation. As Napoleon put it, a nation of shopkeepers. Yeah, exactly. At, at, Maybe at, we've gone back to that. At one point. Tim, have you had a chance to think about whether, in your opinion, it's, it's China, India, perhaps Turkey, new powerhouses, appositely, or, or whether it's somewhere else? I have zero doubt China aims to dominate the world in zero emissions technology industries of the future. 
they already are the dominant player. So to me, the jury is already in. You only have to look at electric vehicles. China was more than half the world's electric vehicle market last year alone. They are five times a bigger producer of electric vehicles than Tesla in America. So to me, the jury is already in. America is trying to defend industries of the prior decade, the prior century, and China is just leapfrogging ahead because it, exactly as Kingsmill said, it's about energy security. China has been importing fossil fuels for decades and it wants to move to domestic sources of clean energy, zero pollution, zero carbon emissions and low cost. But the other one, the wild card in it is India. And that's my favourite country at the moment. India imports 80% of oil, 20% of its coal, 50% of its gas. So they are one of the biggest importers of fossil fuels in the world. And Prime Minister Modi is embracing the energy transformation with both hands. And he's absolutely accelerating low cost deployments of renewable energy. You know, nobody's mentioned the Middle East as a powerhouse of the future, as, as a geopolitical force, which it happens to be ma majorly because of its, its uh, fossil fuels. In, indeed, I mean, clearly, as I say, petrostates inevitably will see depletion in their power. But look, we, I think we need to think about the UK as well. And we are blessed in the UK with this incredibly or organisation, the Committee on Climate Change, which has created this, this net zero target, got enough people to sign up to it, actually creates a marvellous position for, 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 for the UK because we're now seeking to think through in every sector, how do you get there? So we could be leaders of these new energy technologies of the future in the same way as we were 200 years ago. Do you seriously think this was Theresa May's sort of departing wish, wasn't it, that we become a zero carbon emitter by the year 2050? I mean, that would bankrupt the country, wouldn't it? No, that's the whole point. And actually, the... the You're the first person I've actually heard other than a politician say it's a brilliant idea. It's... A, it's um, it, it, you can shift most of the electricity sector within five years you can start shifting the transport sector at zero cost to these new technologies because they're cheaper oh. and and actually it, so so it's 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 a no regret low cost mm -hmm. strategy which enables you to dominate these new industries so i feel we're in a good position actually in the uk okay. so, so justin so sorry i'm going to jump in here uh, put your money where your mouth is where's your mouth uh, my my father's actually, I would follow where the, uh, the technology is going to be. And that may be in the small companies, where I have to search around the world for those small companies. And bear in mind, most of them won't make it because the companies, uh, companies and the countries themselves will be scooping them up. That's what China's doing. Then you look at likes of India and China, particularly India, because they're the ones most likely to be able to get the value out of it quickly. OK, um, fossil fuels then, uh, going underground again. Tim? I certainly think so. And uh, I look at every India every day. I look at China every day. China just announced a $23 billion renewable energy tender. Grid parity, $23 billion, the biggest in the world by a factor of six times, and they did it without blinking. That's the order of magnitude we're talking about. It's going to be a very different world, isn't it, for, for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and it's going to be a very quiet world without the internal combustion engine. But it will also potentially infernal be, combustion energy. It will potentially be um, a world where there's less conflict over limited amounts of fossil fuel resources. Um, a, a, a world where there's more energy to go around. A more equal world. So I don't want to sound especially utopian, but we have the conditions which could create a, a better world. It's also incidentally a world where the um, the amount of energy you get out of, of making a solar panel is now higher than the amount of energy you get by digging an oil well. So, so actually, we can reap the sun, and there's a huge harvest of opportunity. So I think it's a very... I think it's a great world to be in. Fascinating. Final thoughts, Justin? Oh, I think it's going to be very exciting, but beware, eh, here. There are going to be all sorts of wonderfully attractive opportunities for people to lose shed loads of money. <laughs> so be extremely careful. It's very exciting with that potential profit, potential for loss. OK, so if you've got shares in fossil fuel companies, now is the time to... To ditch them. I'd be looking to actually, what's the next day? Where does it go? And this is one of the problems is we, we, don't, we, we know the concept, what it's going to be like, but which company is going to be best at it? If we knew that in advance, it'd be wonderful. So what you're going to have to do is take a, a view on the different companies and probably invest in those for the longer and, term. And, and just one final point, uh, quick thought. Uh, 
we've, we've talked about solar power, we've talked about wind power, we've talked about geothermal power. Is there a source of clean energy, like uh, fusion energy, which is not fission, uh, that we have yet to really discover the potential of? Fusion, as you say, is potentially spectacularly exciting. Um, and it would change the game once more. Uh, let's see. Uh, there are plenty of interesting new energy technologies we, we're uncertain about. I think the reason why all three of us, it would appear, are, uh, are very enthusiastic is because these, pr these technologies of solar wind and, and electric batteries are proven. And they're on established learning curves and the change is happening. You don't need to make any leaps of faith. Fascinating. Listen, thank you. Thank you for staying up late in Australia, Tim. Uh, we appreciate your input. Great to see you again, Justin. Lovely to meet you, Kings Middle. And thank you very much for watching The Future of Fossil Fuels. It really hasn't got one. That's it from me, David Foster, from the team. Thank you for watching. We hope to have your company next time. Goodbye. <laughs>